deeper than the ocean and I need a voice that's bigger than the sky and I need a song that's worthy of your nail sky Good morning, church. Good morning. Um, if you haven't got your seat, come and find one. Plenty over the around, dotted around. Um, we're going to begin and we're going to worship together. My name is Amy, uh, by the way, if you have never met me before. Um, but why don't you stand? And... Um, this morning, I was just, I was actually just saying this to Neil just now, but I, um, I was praying and I sort of woke up this morning just feeling a little bit flat. And, um, and I was thinking, oh, I'm really looking forward to being at church with the church to be ushered in with the praises of his people. Um, and I just wonder if there are some other people in the room this morning who have woken up a little bit like, oh. Um, but actually, we as the body of Christ, as we worship together, we draw each other in to the presence of God. Um, and so whilst you're, even if you're here right now and you're feeling it and you're like, yeah, I'm ready to sing at the top of my lungs, do it, do it. Do it for the people around you. Do it for those that have come in this morning that need to be brought in with you as you raise your hallelujah, as you raise up your voice, your sacrifice of praise this morning, because I know and you know that he is worth it and he is so worthy of our prayers this morning. And so Holy Spirit, we just thank you so much that you're here. We thank you that you're in our midst and you say that when we come together, you're here. And so by faith, we say thank you. We thank you that you're here and we ask, Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you um, open up our lungs to sing and praise your name as you truly deserve? And so why don't you do that now, just as the band goes, why don't you just bring your songs, bring your praise, bring your worship um, to God as we are led in Jesus' name.
Jesus, there's nothing impossible. Jesus, Jesus, you 
silence fear Jesus, Jesus You make the darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus Jesus, Jesus You make the darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus You silence fear Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, your name is a light that the shadows can't deny, your name will not be overcome, your name is a light forever lifted high your name will not be overcome your name your name is a light that the shadows can't deny your name will not be overcome no it won't your name is a light forever lifted high your name
You silence the blows of sin and grace. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name. Psalm 29 says, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. 
The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian like a young wild ox. The, the voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare, and in his temple all cry, Glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Jesus, you're the Lord. You're the Lord. And we come against in this place any lie which suggests that there is another name that will be forever exalted. That there is another name determining the events of our destiny. That there is another name determining our future. Yours is the name. Yours is the glory. Yours is the honor. You hold the power. You have the keys to death and Hades. Your kingdom shall not fail. Your name will be worshipped and glorified forever. We raise our eyes to see you in and on your throne. Because yours is the name. Yours is the name. Above every name. And at your feet and at your name, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that you are glorified that you are God, that you are judge, and every world leader will face your judgment, God. Only you are righteous, only you are just, only you are good. We, your church today, come under you. Only you are good, God. out your own worship to him who is enthroned to him who is forever worshipped and glorified by the angels oh we're joining with the angels today only you Jesus are worthy only you are worthy praise, praise, praise Praise in the middle of the chaos. Praise as we see the pain in the world. Praise to you, God. Yes. Our praise is our intercession. Our praise is our prayer. Yeah, I just really... Um just really felt in the worship that this is a moment um, where so much is going on, isn't there, to um, bend into fear. And I felt like the Lord was saying, just look at my, like tipping our face back to look at him. And so even as Johnny was praying, as he continues to pray, let's just do that. If you know you're bending in to fear, you know you're being pulled back, just allow Jesus to lift up your head again this morning. And so Lord, we lift our heads to you. Jesus, Jesus, and whatever that looks like for you, whatever it means you need to let go of, repent of, whatever it is, but to keep looking at Jesus. Church has two modes in worship. 
And we get this from the Psalms. The first mode is the mode of praise. Praise is warfare. Praise is intercession. And we praise because He's good. He's always and only good. But the other mode is the mode of lament, where we cry out to Him and we lament because He's good. We lament because in the, in the face of what we see in the world and His goodness, we say, God, how can it be? How can it be this way? And we're going to sing a song uh, of lament together. And we're going to pray a little bit out of this as well. God is love When blood rolls down Upon our lands A mother's lose Their only sons Where is the hope Oh God, we pray for wide river day, and we pray for peace upon our hearts again. Only God can save our nations now. And
Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on us today. Let's let that be our prayer. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Us, we pray for Ukraine, for Russia, for Syria. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Every war torn family, every broken home, Lord, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. we bring you our praise, we bring you our lament, knowing that when we praise, we join with the angels, when we lament, we share your heart for a grieving and hurting world, we praise and we lament because you are good and only good, and your desire for your world is to bring it to fullness, to fill it with your glory and your presence, and you will have your way, and one day you will wipe every tear from every eye. Every broken heart and body will be mended and raised with your son, Jesus. And we pray in the midst of the pain, in the tension that we feel, asking for you, come have mercy, show your mercy, reveal your power and your purposes and your plans. Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Our eyes are on you. And so we pray together the kingdom prayer. Let's declare it this morning. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. 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 Be blessed. Why don't you take a seat? And now we share, share the peace uh, with each other. Share just a moment of peace. And isn't that our prayer? That we'd see an inbreaking of peace in this place and across the world. So why don't we bless one another with a sign of God's peace. Maybe that's a a handshake (laughs) or something. I don't know what you do after that, but do something.
Okay. Lovely. Very good. Well, welcome, welcome to Trinity. If you've not been properly welcomed, then, uh, then this is it. Welcome. It's great to be with you. Uh, we love this church. We think you are awesome. And what God is doing here is, is special. We keep saying we're not special, but what God is doing is special. It feels special. And um, I suppose we are special. We're all special, aren't we? But doesn't that mean none of us are special? I don't know. Anyway, uh, God's up to something. We're excited to be part of it. Our vision is to see the church on fire and the city alive. It's a vision of God moving and renewing all things. He is renewing all things. And uh, we are seeing signs of that in breaking in and among us. If you're new here, maybe you're considering making this place home, we would ask you to stick for six uh, that means that if you can tolerate us uh, for six weeks, there's a good chance that you perhaps could uh, last a little bit longer uh, as well. And so uh, if you're considering making this play, place home, why don't you do that? Stick for six. Good. We have a few updates this morning. Uh, first, I just want to let you know our Easter dates. I think we even have a slide there. Um, but we are going to be having a Good Friday service on Good Friday, uh, which is the 15th of April. Um, and that's 7.30, so come along for that. And then a big Easter celebration, as always, um, on Sunday. Now, within the Easter celebration, we're going to be having baptisms. Woo! Um, and, uh, and we just want to invite anyone, any of you who are, or anyone you know who's thinking that they would like to get baptized, or you're sort of thinking, oh, I, I, I want to know a little bit more about baptism, then we would really encourage you to email Mark. Why don't you stand up, Mark? Woohoo! Or you can ask him now at the end of the service. Um, but if you email mark at trinitychurchnottingham.org, if you have any questions about baptism or you know you want to get baptized, and he will give you all the information you need about that, including the classes um, that are involved with baptism. Yeah, I mentioned just earlier, sticking for six, making this place your home. There are a number of ways that this place could feel more like home, and one of those is to join a team. There are a load of different teams here at the church. Uh, including uh, the team at the home space, which uh, is Wednesday afternoons. And you can join any number of those teams. And we do say that that is one of the best ways to make connections here. So if you're looking for connection, do consider that. And if you're looking for connection, one thing to consider is focus. Focus is our, our and I'm, I'm talking about our now, not just this church, but the, the movement of which we're a part, um, the HTB network, if you like. It's the, it's the annual holiday um, shindig, getaway, all those sorts of things, and um, there's a whole group of churches, and there's usually a few thousand people there, uh, but we will be camping together as a church, and it is happening this year in Newark, which is, which is very local. Come on, Newark. Uh, and so just to say that if you're looking, if you like a discount, you want cash back, you need to book really this week because currently there's a £30 offer, £30 off. It's not £30 on, it's £30 off. They never tell you what it is on, do they? £20 off, how much is it on? Anyway, it's £30 <laughs> off uh, up till this next Sunday. And it's half price or, uh, half price or, half price. Price or, or free if you serve on <laughs> kids as well. So if you're interested in that, do sign up. And I think Adam's here. He's going to tell us something about community space. Community man. Here he is. <laughs> Should I take that one? Yeah. Hello. Once you've saved your £30, um, <laughs> you can then spend it. <laughs> um, well, yeah, we were chatting and um, we thought if we're going to go on a summer holiday together, um, we should really eat together and hang out together. So uh, we're wanting to, in our little part of the campsite, have um, a community space, uh, which looks like another big tent, I suppose. Um, but we want to have a big marquee, somewhere to sit, hang out together. Um, but then Jane and I also thought we could cook some grub as well and eat together. That would be really important. Um, so once you've saved your 30 quid, spend it in a little bit more. If you go further down the focus page on the website... Um, it's £55 for adults, and we're going to do breakfast and dinner, and it'll be, you won't be hungry. 
Um, and yeah, and it also covers some of the costs of just uh, a place for us to do the community bit together. Is that good? And uh, oh yeah, and you need to do that by the 30th of June. I don't want to get told off by Jane for no. getting the information wrong. No, that's good. Thank you. Is Adam. that enough from me? That's so okay. so good Best from you. Best of luck. Well done from you. Yes. Well done you. Okay, we're going to take up our offering uh, now. Uh, this is part of our worship. We're not looking to build a community of consumption, but of contribution where each of us brings our gift, who we are and what God has given us uh, to this kingdom cause that he's working out in this city. And one of the key ways that we do that is through financial giving. If you're not yet giving to the life of the church, I would encourage you to begin to do that. If you don't feel you can give to this church, I would encourage you to find one where you feel like you are totally behind the vision and you can give. Uh, So I want to encourage us to do that. And and as we do that, we're going to consider the big picture, which is God's generosity to us. So let's just take a moment to do that. Father God, as we pause in the midst of the busyness, in the midst of the wordiness, Thank you for your gifts to us. Breath in our lungs, food in our bellies, money in our pockets, friends in our lives, opportunities that land before us. We pray, God, that you would teach us to respond to these gifts with open hearts and open hands. Shape us in and according to your image. Thank you for being a generous father to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite Colin to come and read to us. Colin's had three, four minutes notice, uh, but he's got some practice in this kind of thing. So, Colin, thank you for reading 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in case you were wondering. (laughs) And there's some cracking names in this as well, so bear with me. (laughs) Uh, 1 Corinthians, the whole of it. (laughs) Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and brother Sosthenes. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there will be no divisions among you, but that you will be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. So no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus beyond that. I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send to me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, It's the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? 
Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who call, God has called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Colin, I think after that you could have, you could have dropped the microphone let alone placed it down. There'll be a career in that for you. Why don't we pray? Father, as we consider these words, these powerful and beautiful words, let them become truth within us. Let them drop into our hearts, our imaginations, let them reframe our expectations. May we encounter Christ Jesus through them this morning. Amen. Amen. I don't know if you've played that game, have you, where you choose three, five, let's, let's say three, dinner party guests, alive or dead. You can invite anyone to come to your table and you can sit with them and have an evening conversing with them, asking them any question you want. If you haven't done it, why don't you just have a little think as I'm speaking. Who is it? If you could ask anyone, living or dead, who would it be? What's that, Shane? You'd invite me. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't know who you'd invite, but it's, a, it's an interesting question. Even beyond who you might invite, how would you begin to relate? How would you begin to spark conversation among you. You would want, if you're anything like me, with one of your heroes or three of your heroes around the table, you would be particularly desperate to put your best foot forward, wouldn't you? That's what you'd want to do. You'd want to impress them. You'd want to bring out your best anecdotes, drop some of your best chat. Maybe you'd want to establish connection. You know there are there are only seven degrees of separation, are there not, between every human person? So you might want to establish some people that you both know. Maybe that would be possible. Or you could do what I like to do. My favorite strategy for influencing people and winning friends, you might like to name drop. You'll never guess who I know. Once when I was chatting to uh, such and such, maybe you'd want to do that to connect with <laughs> that person, a surefire way of uh, establishing credibility or making yourself look like an idiot, one of the two. This Lent, we are, we are in Lent, by the way. It just happened on Wednesday. But we're going to be looking at the cross of Jesus. In fact, not just at the cross, but we're going to be looking through the cross. Our intent is to stare through the cross and the purpose of doing this is that we might encounter Jesus Christ in a new way. And so we're still aiming for renewal. Because whenever we encounter Jesus, what we are doing is to encounter the one who is able to renew every part of us. But we want to do that as we look at the cross. 
And what's fascinating as we look at the cross is we encounter a God who is identified, who chooses to be identified amongst the worst of us, the least of what the world has to offer, a God who is absolutely, in his essence, not a name dropper, a social climber, but one who descends to the depths. And even as we begin to look and ask the question, why would it be that God reveal himself in the cross and on the cross? Why would it be that God would be uh, one who does that? We're going to ask that question by taking a journey to the church in Corinth. And that's the, the church that Paul is writing to in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and Colin's already read uh, the first chapter of 1st Corinthians too, hasn't he? And if, and if you were following closely, if you weren't, as I was, mesmerized by the beauty of his dulcet tones, I'm thinking, where I heard that voice before? <laughs> You may be caught a little bit of the context of what's happening in 1 Corinthians, a little bit of the story into which the Apostle Paul is speaking. And the story in 1 Corinthians is a story fundamentally of division. It's a church which is not really all that old, which has not been together really for all that long, that's already beginning to be divided and torn apart. And the fundamental reason, or one of the fundamental reasons they've become a divided community is they've been uh, distracted, they've become a cult of celebrity. They're just a bunch of name droppers. Ha! Who baptized you? (laughs) Stephanus, uh, uh, no, who was it? Apollos, Apollos baptized me, or Cephas, or Cephas baptized me, and or I was baptized by Paul. I love it, and and we all laughed, didn't we, as uh, Colin shared that. Paul couldn't even remember who he'd baptized. Isn't that great? (laughs) Let's just read that again because it's jokes. I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. So no one can say you were baptized by me. Brackets. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. Anyway, this is fantastic. So they've become name droppers. They've become distracted by the cult of celebrity. They want to align themselves with different human voices. That's what they're wanting to do, and it's all a power play. And alongside that, they're also seeking power through what they deem to be powerful spiritual gifts. They're particularly infatuated with the gifts, and among all the gifts, the the gift of tongues, because they see it as an angelic language through which they're participating in the most powerful expression of spirituality. And all of this name dropping or gift dropping, it all seeks to divide and and distract from the true message of the gospel. They've forgotten the basic Christian story. And they've begun to live in a worldly story, a worldly narrative. And it's causing pain and heartache. And Paul writes to the church to get them back on script. To get them back on script on message. How does he do that? With a relentless focus on Jesus. But not just on Jesus. Interestingly, in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul doesn't focus on the life of Jesus. He doesn't say who preached that message about the kingdom. Refer back to Matthew 6. No, Paul refers specifically to the cross of Jesus. They'd forgotten about the cross of Jesus. They had become offended by the cross of Jesus. For them, it had become unpalatable, and so they focused on a message which had better play with the focus groups in Corinth. It was more of a a seeker message. That's what we need. A seeker-sensitive Christianity. Let's talk to them about how they can have their best life now. You heard one of those messages? Paul says that's the message that's causing the pain. And so, in the midst of the offense at the message of the cross, Paul zeroes in on the cross. I love it. (laughs) 
The very thing they didn't want to look at, he makes them look at it again. But why would they have been offended? Why so distracted? Why did they miss the main point? Well, Paul's letter is about reminding them of this main thing, which is Jesus and the message of the cross. His position is that if we want to understand how God is at work in the world, first and last, we need to look at the death of Jesus on a cross 2,000 years ago. And here's what he says in verse 17 to 19, after the baptism bit. For Christ has not sent me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, the very things they wanted the most from their leaders. Leaders like Apollos. Not with wisdom and eloquence, eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. He wants to focus on the cross because that is where the power is at. Here's how Eugene Peterson paraphrases it in the message. God didn't send me out to collect a following for myself. By the way, beware of leaders who seek to do that. But to preach the message of what he has done, collecting a following for him. And he didn't send me to do it with a lot of fancy rhetoric of my own. Lest the powerful action at the center, Christ on the cross, be trivialized into mere words. Beautiful emphasis, a rigorous emphasis on the cross. That is the Christian message. That is the apostolic strategy. Paul's strategy to this divided community is to focus them back in on the message of Jesus. Why had they turned away? Why is it that they turned away? Well, listen to this, verses 22 through 25. Jews demand signs. Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. I, this is one of my favorite passages of scripture in the whole Bible. I love it. Why have they become distracted? Well, they've become distracted, easy for me to say, distracted because Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. Somehow in the middle of their Christian lives, the cross just didn't connect. It didn't seem to work. Why? Because it was foolish to them. It was a stumbling block to them, because it was so countercultural and offensive. It offended their sensibilities, their expectations, their demands, and their desires. It was at cross purposes with the story the culture was telling. And Paul uses two words particularly to, to describe this. The first is foolishness, the second is a stumbling block. Let's look at that, foolishness. Why is the cross foolishness to them? Well, the Greek culture of the day, the culture that Paul is uh, speaking into, the, the culture that was primary in Corinth was a culture which valued wisdom, philosophy, rhetoric, eloquence, fancy ways of speaking. That was, the, that was what carried weight. That had cachet. And the Christian message of a crucified Jesus didn't play well. As I said, it didn't land in the focus groups where intellect was primary. Well, why not? Well, let's just do some recap. The Christians preached that Jesus of Nazareth, a Jewish preacher born on the fringes of the Roman Empire some 2,000 years and a little bit more ago, was in fact the living God made flesh. That the God who created the, the moon and the stars, the, the whole of the universe, the, the tidal system and, and your cells and who came up with the idea of DNA and all of the other stuff, that he became a baby with a human body. 
And then this Jesus, as he grew up, began a, began a ministry of preaching and teaching and healing. And he spoke about the kingdom of God, the rule and the reign of God. And he embodied that by changing lives. And he initiated a community of the kingdom. He called it his group of disciples. Now, he became immensely popular because of all the good things he was doing and the messages he was preaching. And at the height of his popularity, he was opposed by the Jewish rulers. And they used the the Roman state to crush him. He had a show trial and he he was crushed. And ultimately, he was killed. He was crucified on a Roman cross as a common criminal. He died a slave's death. Not just any death. A particularly gruesome death. And it's interesting that the Gospels themselves don't get into the detail of the death. For them, it didn't seem to be the most important thing. And that may be because everybody who received the Gospels knew about crucifixion. They'd seen crucifixion. That's possibly the answer. And so for us, we need to do a bit of recap. And I hope this isn't going to be unnecessarily gratuitous or gruesome. I'm not try- this isn't my version of a passion of the Christ. But I think it is important for us to capture just how horrific, how abhorrent the death of Jesus, the death of anyone who was crucified would be. It would begin with scourging uh, a whip, a leather whip, in which uh, there would be pieces, fragments of bone or metal embedded, would be used to whip uh, the person who's being crucified, who at this point would be leaning over so that their back and buttocks would be exposed and they'd be completely naked. Now they'd be whipped uh, progressively and over a period of time so that the, uh, the skin uh, would be removed and ultimately the, the whipping would begin to hit uh, the, mu- the muscle. Skeletal muscle would be exposed. At the end of this process, At the end of this process, often the victim would be so weak they'd be unable to walk. Jesus was clearly in this place because somebody else had to carry his cross for him. We see that in the Gospels. Uh, But carry their cross they would have to. And they would be, at this point, uh, subjected to corporate ridicule. People would gather around and spit and shout and call names. So this is, the, not, this is now the, not just the physical torture, this is the psychological torture of crucifixion. And the victim would be ultimately led the victim would ultimately be led to the place where they'd be crucified. And they'd be attached to a cross beam with nails going through the wrists and then nails on the feet, going through the feet, uh, just above the ankles, into a cross. At this point, they'd be elevated to the vertical. Now, this, it was, when you were being crucified, it was physically impossible to inhale because of the position of your body. So in order to take a breath, you would have to lift yourself up by your own exertion, either by pushing from your feet, which had been impaled, or by pulling yourself up by, via the wrists, all just to take a breath. What, you, what killed people was either exposure, if they were strong enough, or um, suffocation. You were fighting for every breath. You eventually became your own executioner. It is not a surprise then that one commentator said this about crucifixion. Crucifixion as a means of execution in the Roman Empire had as its express purpose the elimination of victims from consideration as members of the human race. The purpose of it was to dehumanize. That's what it was aiming to do. It was seeking to, uh, it was only ever used with slaves, typically. Whatever else this was, you can see how this wouldn't have been seen as a valid way for a king to die. In a culture that valued philosophy and intellect and logic and rationality, how could God reveal himself like this? It's irrational. It is fundamentally irrational. No other God reveals himself like this. And so one scholar writes, Christianity is the only major religion to have as its central focus 
the suffering and degradation of its God. The crucifixion is so familiar to us and so moving that it's hard for us to realize how unusual it is as an image of God. Isn't that true? We're so used to seeing it on our tattoos or our jewelry, even on, as Lois was saying the other week, in our intercessions on our school badges, that we just miss how offensive, how, how insane, how irrational, how foolish it was for God to reveal himself in this way. And for the Jews, that was the Gentiles, but for the Jews it was also a non-starter, a stumbling block. In fact, the word stumbling block in the Greek is scandalon. It's the word from which we get the word scandal. It was scandalous for the Jews that God would reveal himself in this way. The Jewish law in Deuteronomy 21, 23 speaks about a prohibition on somebody being hung from a tree. Cursed is the one who is hung from a tree, it says in the law. So for the Jews, yeah, no, understand this, no other way of dying was cursed. Only this way. And so if you died in this way, you were under God's curse. That was the Jewish understanding of death on the cross. And as Paul says, your Jews demand signs. They want to see God show up in power. Who doesn't, eh? Isn't that what we want? We want a God who's acting powerfully among us. We want the God of the Exodus. That's the kind of God we want. That's the kind of God who smites the Egyptian, who comes against their ten gods with ten greater signs and powerful movements, who ultimately re releases them through the sea who parts the seas. That's the God we like to sing about on a Sunday morning. Jews demand signs. There's no place in the Jewish conception of God for a God who is revealed on the cross. Where does the God of the cross fit? In the Gentile mind, in the Jewish mind. No, to the irreligious and to the religious, the cross is a profound disappointment. One of my favorite preachers, who also happens to have the best name of any preacher I've ever heard, Fleming Rutledge. She says this, the cross is offensive to everyone, religious people and secular people alike. All human achievement, especially religious achievement, is called into question by the godlessness of Jesus' death. If God in three persons is most fully revealed to us by the Son's accursed death outside the community of the godly, that means a rethinking of what is usually called religion. This ain't religion. Whatever else is revealed on the cross, this is not religion. And nor is it by any worldly sign, wisdom. It is foolishness by the world's signs. And we've got to recapture the strangeness of the cross if we're going to be intoxicated again by the beauty and the wisdom and the power and the blessedness of the cross. Now the reason the Corinthian Christians had rejected the message was that it flew in the face of every single cultural expectation then just as it does now. The cross is the great reversal. Listen to what Paul says, verse 23. Jews demand signs, Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, both the religious and the irreligious, to those who God has called, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. In this place, in the cross and on the cross of Jesus, that is where God reveals true wisdom. That is where God reveals true power. It is an unlikely message. It's an unlikely place for God to reveal himself as the only wise God, as the all-powerful God, and yet that is just the place, Christians believe, that he does reveal himself in that way. 
It is on that place, as we will see in the weeks to come, that he judges evil. It is, it is on that place that he reveals his mercy and his love for all people. It is on that place that he disarms the powers and the principalities that are arranged against every good force in the universe. It is on that place that he is seen as the universal victor. It is on that place that he makes everything new. It is is on that place and in that place that he atones for sin. There and there alone, God deals with all of that. It is on that place, on the cross of Christ, that he justifies us. And that it is in and through that place that we are sanctified, washed clean, remade. And it's through the cross that he's remaking creation. It's good news, folks. It's good news. It's strange news. It's strange news. And it is good news. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. God's wisdom. God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. God's weakness is stronger than human strength. It's so good. It's so good. So what? What does it mean for us? What does it mean that God is revealed in this way? What does it mean for us, for you and me today? What if this is a pattern for God's activity in our lives? What if God's activity in your life, what about, what, what if God's desire and design for your life is not to make you, in a worldly sense, stronger and stronger and stronger? What about if God's vision for you, in a worldly sense, is not to make you more and more impressive, more and more comfortable? Safer and safer and safer. What if God doesn't want you to cocoon, doesn't want to cocoon you so that you would be untouchable? What about if God is actually calling you to take more and more risks to, to, for you to enter into? Adventure with him. What about if God is actually his design for you is to make you weaker? More vulnerable. More exposed. Less safe. Less comfortable. Are you squirming yet? More dependent. More surrendered. That is God's vision for us. That is. This is how God saves us. What what if God is not interested at all? One bit, even slightly, a tiny little bit in establishing your agenda for your life. Completely disinterested. But really, really, really committed to establishing his kingdom in your life. As you take up your cross daily. It's a complete reversal from the story that culture is telling. He's not actually interested in what you think your identity is. Your life is, you have died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. We take off the old self and we put on the new self which is Christ. We're crucified with Christ. That's the gospel. And so all the stuff about asserting rights, which is so prevalent in our culture, whenever we're doing that, we're not thinking as Christians think. We lay down our rights for the benefit and the betterment of others and for the worship of Jesus. This is how God works in the world. It's how he wants to work in our life. How does he want to work through us and beyond us? What if the cross is the way that God works in the world? It is, right on. What about if he is at work amongst the foolish and in the midst of the foolishness? Not necessarily amongst the applauded, 
but amongst the despised, the weak. What about even now he is using the weak things of the world to shame the strong things? Would this cause us to think differently about what we value? Who we value? Would it cause us to think differently about our intention for our lives? How God might want to use our lives for the benefit of the world? How would we think, if this was how God worked in the world, how would we think differently about our wounds, our weaknesses, our failures? How would we think differently about difficult people? You know the person in your life who is a constant frustration? And if you could, you would banish them. You would cancel them. Don't look to your spouse. What about the unloved person? The irritating person. What if God is working through them? Just this week, Amy and I met with a member of our team who went away. I haven't actually asked her permission to share this, so I won't share her name, but who went away on a prayer retreat as part of our group, I've got an okay, as part of a, a silent retreat. And God spoke to her in the midst of that and gave her a prophetic word for us as a church. But I think it's such a beautiful cross-shaped vision for Christian life. Listen to this. Keep opening up the church. Open more and more of it to the dirtiest Nottingham has to offer. I am not scared. Are you? Then know your God. I am going to make all of them clean. I want their mess. I want them to bring it all and leave it at the foot of my cross. Do you know how strong I am? Can you even comprehend how much I love this city? Don't bring me the ones who are easy to fix. Bring me the worst, the most despairing, horrible, rude, downtrodden, disillusioned, and ugly you can find. And I will show them my kindness. I will show the enemy who is in charge. He will tremble at my gentleness and the depth of my love. I will make him weak. Be obedient to me, and I will change the stench of Nottingham. I will alter the atmosphere around you. I will bring nothing but light to your streets. Where will he do this? How will he do this? He'll do it through the cross. He'll reveal his kindness through the cross. Where will the ugly, the despairing come? Where will the addicts come to find mercy? They'll come to the cross. And there they will find mercy. And there they will find salvation. And there they will find healing. And there they will find transformative power. There and there alone. Because the wisdom of God is wiser than human wisdom. The foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is more powerful than human strength. As we begin this series, In the Cross... And as we think about how we like to identify ourselves among others, let us make a decision to identify ourselves at the cross, to be identified with this story once and for all. Why don't we pray? Just a second, we're going to respond corporately. As we reflect on this strange cross, it confronts us with the terrible beauty of God's love. We're now going to come into a time of repentance ahead of receiving the sign of the cross. And for those that want to, Um, being marked with ash. It's a similar being identified with the cross of Jesus. It's an entry point into Lent. Some words are going to come up on the screen and I'd invite you to join with me in the words in orange. Begin with an invitation. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. Let us then show our love for him by confessing our sins in penitence and faith. We are often slow to follow in the example of Christ. Lord, have mercy. 
Lord, have mercy. We often fail to be known as Christ's disciples. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. We often fail to walk the way of the cross. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Holy God, give us true repentance. Forgive us our sins of negligence and ignorance and our deliberate sins. And grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit to amend our lives according to your holy word. We say together, holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. Just going to hold silence for a moment. And as we do that, why don't you invite the Holy Spirit to search you, to know you, to show you where you need to repent, to turn 180 degrees today. Make our hearts clean, O God, we say together, and renew a right spirit within us. And we say this whole confession together. Father eternal, giver of light and grace, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in what we have thought, in what we have said and done, through ignorance, through weakness, Through our own deliberate fault, we have wounded your love and marred your image in us. We are sorry and ashamed and repent of all our sins for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and lead us out from darkness to walk as children of light. Amen. Just going to welcome uh, those who are coming to help with the the ashing. So again, um, this is like an embodied way of identifying with the cross of Jesus. It is not mandatory. Everything is invitation. Just as you come forward for prayer, it's also invitation. But it is powerful. I'm going to say these words uh, as an invitation. Dear friends in Christ, I invite you to receive these ashes as a sign of the spirit of penitence with which we shall keep this season of Lent. God our Father, you create us from the dust of the earth. Grant that these ashes may be for us a sign of our penitence and a symbol of our mortality. For it is by your grace alone that we receive eternal life. In Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. So why don't the band come? Uh, you can accompany us. Just as the band uh, leaders, why don't you just come forward as you feel led? Got three stations here, so just come as you would.
if you would like to receive prayer, uh, just as you come forward, just why don't you stay? If you've already gone back, feel free to come again and just in the pockets between the lines, we'll just pray for folks. Beyond this lifetime, beyond this darkness, this light. Your cross is shining, so people open your eyes. For oh, the cross stands above it all, burning bright in this life. The cross towers over it all. One hope, one deliverer, Savior. Close our service in just a second with a, a blessing.
may need it on the screen because I don't know what it is. Um, and if you've brought children with you, now's a good time perhaps to go and find them. But Father, we thank you for the sign of the cross. Not just the sign of the cross, the wisdom, the power of the cross. Would you place us in this season afresh under the power of the cross of Christ Jesus? May we learn to glory in the cross, to worship the crucified and risen Jesus. And would you bring the reality of your death and resurrection to us, that it might flow through us to the world that you so love. May the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you, remain with you now and forever. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. If you'd like to receive prayer, it's not too late. If you need to leave, go in peace. We'll see you very soon. Bless you.